introduction. I'm John T. I work up at the University of Southern Queensland, which is up in Toowoomba, and I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, and I spend all of my time trying to understand how the universe works, and in particular how our solar system works and how planets come into being, how they form and evolve, live and die. I thought I'd kind of say a little bit about myself first. I've got lots of pretty artwork in here for that. So I've been interested in astronomy since I was a really, really little boy, actually since I was younger than you guys. I grew up in the north of England in a place called Wakefield. So this is the town I grew up in. Yeah? Yeah? But lots of English people come out to Australia because Australia is better than England, even though I'm not a cricket at the minute. But this is where I grew up. It was a really big town, you're talking a million people plus, part of a big conurbation, loads of towns and cities all squashed together. There's not much room left in the UK. And it was a mining area. So just before I was born, this pit used to be directly opposite where I grew up, but it was closed because the mines were all going out of business. So it was a very working class area where I grew up. But I was really interested in science. So this is me when I was roughly your age, visiting the UK's version of the ditch. So in Australia, you have the dish down in parks, this big radio telescope. This is the English equivalent at a place called Jodrell Bank. <coughs> and that was me on a little trip there, really excited to be doing astronomy. The good thing about figuring out what I love and what I wanted to do with my life really young was that I was able to study for the right subjects to get to where I am now, to get to do my hobby as my job. And my studies took me after I left school to Durham. This is a place in the north of England that's very, very beautiful. And I spent four years there at university from the age of 18 to 21, so a long way in the future for you guys. And I spent my time there studying physics and astronomy. And that's what set me up to do what I do now. I then moved to Oxford in the south of England and studied in this beautiful, beautiful college for three years. Yeah? Yeah? It's a really pretty place, but it rains a lot all the time. Yeah? My cousin's in Oxford. Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely place to visit. If you ever get to go there, lots of tourists, but lots of really pretty old buildings. This building, this college that I was in, was built 800 years ago, 700 years ago. Really old, really cool. I then moved out to Switzerland, and this was my first proper job. And this was my view every single day when I left my office, other than when it was cloudy. These are the Alps. These mountains are 4,000 meters high, and they have snow on all year round. Really, really cool. I then moved back to the UK and went to a place that's basically the UK's version of Canberra. A little bit dull, a little bit boring, called Milton Keynes, and then I moved to Australia. And I was down in Sydney, at New South Wales, for three and a half years. And now I'm in Toowoomba, just up the hill. Yep. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's a nice place. Yeah. Um, my mum grew up there. Yeah. It's a lovely, lovely place to live, and I'm really happy there. Um, but it's a lot colder than down here. But anyway, what we're talking about today is night and day, and I know that you've been doing a lot of work on this recently, so I thought I'd give you a bit of a refresher and tell you some other cool things, basically. Now, in daytime, like at the minute, we get sunshine, and the sun's really important for life on Earth. In many ways, it's the single most important thing we have. The sun gives us everything we need for life. It keeps the Earth warm. It keeps it warm enough for water to be liquid, warm enough for us to actually survive and wear t-shirts and <coughs> fly out in the sunshine. But it also drives everything on Earth to do with life, because it drives the growth of plants. The sunlight outside has been absorbed by the grass, by the trees, and drives something we call photosynthesis. And that's how plants live and how plants grow. If there were no plants, there'd be no animals that eat plants. And if there were no animals that eat plants, there'd be no animals that eat animals. So all of life is driven by that sunlight. And if the sun wasn't there, we didn't have the sun, the Earth would be frozen solid. The Earth would be so cold, it would be 270 degrees below freezing. <coughs> all the time it would be dark. The, Earth, the water on Earth would be frozen solid, so it would be harder than steel. Now this obviously isn't the Earth. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah? Not our moon, but it is a moon. It's a moon around a different planet. It's not Pluto. Go for one more guess. Who thinks I've got it? You put your hand up. Mercury. No. 
This is actually somewhere called Europa. Has anybody heard of Europa? No, a few people looking like they have. Europa is a moon around Jupiter. It's about the same size as our moon, but it's covered in ice. Really an incredible place. This ice sheet you see here is like the ice in Antarctica. It's frozen solid. Yep? Now, well, has any astronaut ever gone under the ice? To not see not what yet. Is? Not yet. So, astronauts have only gone to the moon so far. That's the furthest we've ever travelled. This is around Jupiter. This is far, far further away, nearly a billion kilometres away. But we think that under the ice, there may be an ocean. We think the ice is maybe 10 kilometres thick, thicker than the ice in Antarctica. And underneath that, there might be an ocean. <coughs> Dark, because no sunlight gets in, 100 kilometres deep. There could even maybe possibly be life there, but it's not necessarily that likely. Yeah? That's not the coldest place. It is cold, but the further from the sun you go, the colder it gets. So this is five times further from the sun than we are. So it gets about 1 25th as much sunlight, which makes it a lot colder. Pluto is, at the moment, about 35 times further from the sun than we are. So that's seven times further from the sun than Europa is, so it's even colder. Yeah? And what's the furthest planet away from the sun? The furthest planet from the sun in our solar system is Neptune. So Neptune is one of the eight things in our solar system that we call planets. They're the things that are big enough for us to say, we think you're planets. Smaller than the planets, we have lots of other things in our solar system that aren't quite big enough to be planets. We've said this in the playground beforehand, that in our solar system we have things of all different shapes and sizes, from the very biggest being the sun and then Jupiter down to little bits of grains of dust floating around. <coughs> there are more of the little things than there are the big things. And so in order to try and understand them, we break them into categories. And we do this with people. So all people are people, from when you're a little baby to when you're a really old person. But to make it easier to manage our lives and to figure out how life should work, we split people up into groups. We talk about children, and we talk about grown-ups, adults, and we talk about retired people, old people. Is there really any difference between someone who's 15 and a half years old and 16 years old? No. They look the same. No. But we say that someone at 16 is an adult, they've grown up. Someone 15 and a half is still a child. So we've put a line there to split off children from grown ups. And in general, you'd agree that there are differences between children and grown ups, but they're part of the same spectrum, the same spread of things. And we do the same with the planets to understand them better. So between Mercury, and Ceres and Pluto, which are the next biggest things after Mercury, there's actually quite a big gap in size and weight. And so that's where we put the line and we say, the bigger ones are planets, the smaller ones are dwarf planets. Smaller than dwarf planets, you have asteroids and comets. Okay? Um, why are the lines so So that's a really good question. We think we have some answers to this, but it's a good way to tell you about how science works. And astronomy is very obvious of science. With most of the science you're doing in class, you do experiments, don't you? You try and work out how things work by getting them in front of you and doing things to them. With astronomy, we can't do that. All these things are too far away. So all we can do is look at them from a great distance. So we're like detectives. We're looking at all these clues, and we have to piece together the story of how things work. So astronomy is like a detective story. And here we have a clue. We've got these cracks and stripes across the ice on Europa. Now, if you've got ice and it's floating on top of an ocean, that ice can move around, can't it? Just like the plates on the Earth float on top of the mantle and you get the plate tectonics that gives us earthquakes and volcanoes. So what we think our current best story is that this ice is constantly moving around on Europa. And Europa's surface is being pulled and tugged on by the other moons and by Jupiter, just like we get tides on the Earth. And between the movement of the ice and the pulling and tugging on it, it makes it crack. And when you get a crack, material from underneath can well up in the crack and fill the crack, a bit like volcanoes, volcanism. So we think these cracks are more evidence that you've got the ocean underneath and that the ice is floating around and occasionally breaking and fracturing. I think your question was next. Um, so does the sun affect volcanoes? The sun, it's a good question, does the sun have volcanoes? So the sun is made of gas. And plasma. It doesn't really have a solid surface. 
So when we're looking into the sun, it's like looking into a glowing fog, and the surface we see is as far as we can see into the fog. So it doesn't have directly things that are like volcanoes, but what it does have are things like solar flares and prominences, which is material bubbling up and boiling out of the surface. So it's a bit more like if you watch a pan of water boiling, you see the water sometimes splashing up in the air. That's the nearest thing that the sun has to volcanoes. But because the sun's so big and so hot, those splashes of material going up into space can be many, many times bigger than our planet. They can be millions of kilometers long flying up into space. Yeah? Yeah. Because since water has lots of pressure on it, yeah. and it's thick, it will keep on cracking more and more. Could do. So you've got the ocean underneath, and there will be pressure from the ocean on the ice, which is why the ice is floating. Right? But as the ice moves around, different bits of ice won't necessarily move in the same direction. So you'll get ice pushing together, and ice pulling apart. And that's where you'll get the cracks, so it's the movement that's probably really doing it. You sit there and you see the nearby trees moving quickly and the distant trees moving slowly. What we actually feel, what we're aware of when we think about movement, isn't actually the movement that we're doing, it's the acceleration when that movement changes. That's what we feel. So when you're in the car, you feel yourself going over bumps. You feel yourself bouncing up and coming down. If you're moving very, very smoothly, you barely notice that motion. And what's happening when the Earth's spinning is that movement is incredibly smooth so we're moving constantly in whatever direction at, say, a 1,000 kilometers an hour, which sounds really quick, but it's very smooth. The acceleration we have is making us turn around and do one spin in 24 hours. Now, if you're spinning so slowly that you spin like this and it takes you 24 hours to go all the way around, you won't notice, will you? It's so slow. Because everything's moving with us. That's the thing. So, like I said, the best analogy I can give is if you're ever in the car or on a bike or something where you're moving at a very steady speed and you can't feel the movement because your speed is unchanging. Um, trying to think of another way to visualize it. It is that what you're feeling is the changes in your movement when you're in the car. So when you go around a corner, you feel yourself change and bumping and things like that. If you go on something where you're moving really smoothly, it's almost as if the rest of the world's moving around you and you're stationary. And it's the same thing. It's not just that the Earth's spinning, the Earth's moving around the Sun as well. And we don't feel that, it's a very smooth motion. We don't feel the Sun going around <coughs> the middle of the galaxy. Everything is always in motion. But what we pick up, what we feel as movement, is actually changes in the way we move. And that's a really key thing. And that, I know that's really difficult to get your head around and really difficult to understand. So I had real trouble getting my head around that as well when I was younger. And as I say, the best way you experience it and the point at which you realize it is if they ever do enough road work, that the road is really, really smooth, and you can get your parents to stay at exactly the same speed for a bit, close your eyes, can you tell you're moving? And you probably <coughs> can't, because you're not feeling any acceleration. Um, if you've ever been on a roller coaster with loop the loops you know if you close your eyes when you go around the loop the loop it just feels like you're going over a hill. Without having the visual clue to tell you that you're going upside down, because your brain's just picking up on the acceleration, your change in movement, and not the actual truth of exactly how you're moving. So I think that's, it's still really difficult to get your head around, and I'm sorry for that. But you will get it if you get in the car and you go really smoothly. But the point is you're not actually feeling movement. The air's moving with you, so you've got no wind blowing through your head to give the movement away. The ground's moving with you, so you can't see it moving. The only thing that gives that movement away is the sun going across the sky, and the stars at night moving across. Now, I've got to move on, otherwise I'll get in trouble, but we can take more questions a bit later on. Just don't want to not get to the end of this, and I'll get told off it, and that's never good. Well, we can't see the sun all the time, and this is what you're doing with day and night. So this is a picture of the Earth, <coughs> and this part of the Earth is pointing towards the sun, so it gets daylight. Here is where it's either dawn or dusk, <coughs> where the sun's about to set, and over here, you're pointed away from the sun. The sun's below the horizon, so it's dark, it's night time. And that's a really important thing for us. And as the Earth spins, that's why we get day and night. People stood here have daytime, they're looking towards the sun. People stood over here are looking away from the sun in the sky. The Earth's blocking the sun out, so it's dark, and that's why it's in shadow. Now, this is a real photograph of the Earth and Moon that was taken by a spacecraft we were sending out to Jupiter. 
that was flying past the Earth on its way out there got this photograph of the Earth and Moon together. So that gives you an idea of how big the Moon is compared to the Earth. Yeah. But you can also see that on the Moon, you probably get day and night as well. If you could live on the Moon, which would be really challenging, you'd have time when the Sun was in the skies and time when it was behind the Moon. Now, I'm not answering questions just yet, because again, I'll get in trouble. So, if you were flying above the Earth and hovering above one point, just let's say that's Australia there, we're hovering somewhere over the Indian Ocean here, watching the Earth, we're spinning around with the Earth, and so you can see, sun rises, you get daytime, nighttime, daytime, nighttime. One spin of the Earth on its axis, like this, one rotation of the Earth, gives you one full day. The sun comes up, it sets, and then it rises again. Now back ages ago, because you can't feel the motion of the Earth, the best explanation